cool. To be honest with you, me putting that note, this meeting will be recorded. It's really a reminder to me to remember to record this meeting. But it's also nice for me to, to make sure that you know. Um, all right, well, awesome. Thanks so much, everyone, for coming to the Enterprise Working Group call. I, I realise it's um, the last one was in May, so it's actually been a little bit longer than we would have liked. And I know that the um, discussion around keeping it regular was that we should try and keep it regular. So what I'll probably do is look to maybe try and look in this time, seeing as it seems to work for folks, and, and just make that into a monthly or four weekly cadence. Um, so Greg isn't able to make it today, um, so I'm going to be running the call, but I'm going to be running the calls anyway, because I've just started um, working with the FreeBSD Free Foundation to support and some program management stuff. Um, so I'm, I'll say a little bit about myself just so you know like why I'm here and why, you, why you've got me and not Greg today. Um, I'm specifically working with Greg on a number of technical community projects, so I'll be taking over the running of this group, but Greg will still be active in the group. Um, and we'll be working together on it. <clears throat> My background is that I've been working in the B2B tech sector for over 15 years, especially cloud native development tools or developer tools. Um, and I've been working quite a diverse number of roles, which include product management and developer relations, just a couple there. To clarify, I'm not a developer, but I have worked directly with developers for that whole 15 plus years. So. I feel very comfortable in technical spaces. Um, having said that, there will be stuff that I don't understand in this call. Um, so if I ask questions, I'll try to keep them to a minimum. I'll probably just Google stuff later. Um, outside of FreeBSD work, I'm active with a number of other open source projects. So Chaos, which is um, project metrics for open source projects, and the To-Do Group, which is a community of practice for open source offices, open source program offices, I should say. And I already mentioned I'm in the UK, so now you know everything. All right, um, so let me get started with the slide. Um, housekeeping. Um, always at the start of these public calls, we're going to flash this up. You should know it. We probably do know it. it's very similar to any other groups that are open source that you will know. There is a code of conduct. You can go and check it out. The highlights are here. It just means Try to behave yourself. <laughs> Do your best. Um, so I got these slides from, from Greg. I have reviewed them. Um, obviously, I wasn't in any of the previous calls. So if you see any inaccuracies, you can just let me know. Oh, wait. Someone's making a sound. Oh, hey, Carmi. Could you mute, please? Uh, yeah, probably. Thank you. Uh, OK, so if anyone's new here today, then the Enterprise Working Group was created after there was some feedback given around the, the idea that FreeBSD would, would, is not necessarily ready or, or ideally set up for a general use server. Um, so the feedback was taken and then um, opened up to more people to give some suggestions. And that's how the group has, has been created. Um, there's been these kind of six out of seven steps already done, which is great. Um, of course, the step number seven is probably the hardest one, <laughs> which is why that's the one where we're, we've been on for, for a little while. Uh, our goal is to make steady progress. So we have a number of projects that we've actually broken down into work streams now. So when you see this slide deck, you'll see that it's similar to how it was before, but it's now a little bit more structured in terms of work streams. And something where I'm going to be putting more effort into is to document the progress and publish updates on this so that we should start to see a little bit more detail, a little bit more structure in some of this. And, and I'll be doing some work to, um, you know, ask for updates and, and support people who are trying to get things done. OK. The charter we have here. I think I just mentioned it, but this explains it slightly more clearly. Having FreeBSD as a general purpose, purpose server for enterprise, uh, we're looking at getting a, a set of features that we agree on and then onboarding developers and users to support getting those features ready for use. Success, success metrics, I'm um, not going to go into those 
too much because that's something that I want to um, build on over time. But it's basically, you know, there are things that we know we'll need to see as we get further along with this group. Cool. Um, so these first few slides are similar to what we've seen in other meetings, which is why I'm not going to go into them in too much detail. Um, two types of gaps have been identified, feature gaps and infrastructure gaps. Um, we're mainly talking about feature gaps in the working group, um, but I can let, I think we have Ed on the call somewhere. I'll let Ed um, jump in if he thinks I'm <laughs> diverting the message somewhat. So this is probably the first slide that's new. It's not new, it's updated, but it's got new information because it's updated. So these are the work streams or features um, that we're taking a look at as part of the group. We've got cloud native where we're, we're doing work with the OCI working group, which is the OCI runtime extension group for running containerized workloads. Um, that's going really well. Um, and that's one of my focuses on uh, that's one of the pro programs that I'm looking after. So I've been here two, well, not two or three weeks, four or five weeks. It doesn't feel that long. Um, so that's that's something I'm just getting up to speed with. Beehive manageability. Um, I realise I don't know what colour these dots were in the previous slide, but it's green, which is good. So we're doing well with the requirements. Um, and we've also identified clone or clone OS. Um, it, that's been developed by a, a, gr a group in Russia, so I think uh, not all the docs are eligible if you can't can't um, read Russian, but it's it's a pretty interesting one to take a look at. Then we've got Active Directory DNS integration, um, which John Hickson's working on, AI support, and Greg's put a little note in there to say um, he's actively working on some edge AI efforts. I, I do know what those are, but I don't know how far he's gotten and how much he wants to share. So he is asking that you reach out to him if that's something you're interested in, in doing. Then we've got the Open JDK or Java support. Uh, we can say more about that, but we're, we're looking for someone to help on the developer side. It's funded, but we don't. It's blocked because we can't find someone. <clears throat> Samba 4.x as another John Hickson one. Don at support. Oh, excuse me. <clears throat> Don, dot net support also green um, SMBFS SMBFS two and three we're working to get a fork on that uh, Kerberos uh, is that a licensing change shift to MIT I'm looking around who knows that it's a shift from the Heimdall Kerberos implementation to the MIT Kerberos implementation okay I think I need to know more about that. E BPF, I think that's deprioritized actually, but we'll talk about that when we get to it. And then CIS benchmark, which should be, I don't know if Greg, if we do have an update on that one, but um, it should be updated somewhere around now or completed somewhere around now. All right. Um, so I can take this update. I think I might be well placed for that and I think we've also uh, Kami you've been on those calls although you weren't on the most recent one and I don't know who else we have in who's involved with that but I'll I'll take this update so um so basically we don't have a production ready support for containerized workloads on FreeBSD um because we don't have support for OCI compatible containers so OCI's Open, Open Container Initiative, it's a CNCF um, set of um, standards, I guess, for runtime extensions for operating systems. Uh, we don't have a runtime extension for FreeBSD that meets that um, standard. And that makes using other container management tools like Podman, Docker, Kubernetes, uh, very difficult if you, if you want to use FreeBSD. Um, and th so this is a this is a new format of slide. I, I didn't introduce it. And uh, Greg's put <laughs> Greg's put a, a placeholder for vision statement, and I'll come on to that in a second. Oh wait, chat messages. I wasn't keeping an eye on those. Okay. All right, nothing. Got it. Um, so 
where are we at with that? Um, we've got the work, we've got the working group already set up. We have bi-weekly meetings. Those times have changed on those because I don't work Fridays. Um, I didn't mention it. I'm only working part time. I don't work Fridays. So those mon those meetings are now on Mondays every second week. Um, so it won't be this Monday coming. It'll be the one after. We have. Um, in terms of requirements, MVP and testers, the approach that we're going to take is to rather than try to collect requirements as a paper exercise, we're going to create a beta. I'm putting beta in inverted commas just because we're actually going to make something different in the end, but we're using it as a sort of functional beta for the Podman implementation because we really want some people to start using it so that we can get a sense of what kind of things people want to put on FreeBSD in containers and what kind of functionality is most important to them, which will help with prioritising a roadmap. Um, and it will also help us with that vision statement that was on the previous slide. Um, so it's not completely ready to invite people to the beta testing, um, but I'm working on it as one of my priorities. So if you or someone you know is interested in testing that out and giving feedback, um, just reach out to me and I'll put you on the uh, outreach when we do that. So I think that's about it for cloud native and ACI. Um, do we have, um, who was it, Chris here? I'm just trying to see who we have. Chris might have been there. No, okay. So does anybody, is anybody involved with the Beehive manageability work? Or maybe Ed, I don't know if you, you're a bit closer to this. I'm not super familiar with it. Well, I haven't been directly involved in uh, in the Beehive uh, discussions in this part either. Yeah, Chris has indeed been very active, but isn't present. I know yeah. he has a tool and he has a few presentations at EuroBSDCon. So great work, Chris. And his documentation has been excellent. I, I'm, I'm currently working on a VM Beehive fork called VM Beehive NG, which only adds currently two basic features. One of them is uh, jailed uh, Beehive uh, VMs, and the other one is uh, some kind of supervision using uh, uh, the daemon command, at least for now. Uh, Jan, has some, so Jan has pointed out over the Beehive calls what issues we might face. Uh, when using the daemon command itself due to its limitations, but at least to have a POC because 90% of the community is very familiar with the VM behind uh, command itself. So um, what I have is not ready for prime time, but I did prototype it out and found that Beehive needs a parent process which can dispatch on the exit code to for guests to be able to reboot themselves. Uh, which is well known and, and kind of implicitly even documented. Uh, but what's missing is the automation, for example, to add the tab interface to bridges, create the bridge that is not existing uh, in the system already, and then stuff like this, and especially around storage automation, for example, to uh, create a cam, uh, target layer port so that you have a virtual HBA and then set that up with it IO SCSI and set up a LAN map so that the um, the virtual host bus adapter you're handing into your Beehive guest only has access to the disks you wanted to have access to and yeah, setting all of that up level. is very, uh, let's say yeah. cumbersome, but possible. Correct, and Chris's work does address much of that um, among other projects, but I'm sure uh, Alice wants to keep this high level at this point. Do And you're all invited to the Beehive calls if you wanna geek out. They take place every Thursday. Thanks, Michael. Yeah, I, I, I'm not, I think higher level is probably best in terms of like, let's we talk about status and, and focus and things, you know, areas that we want to develop next. Um, but it's it's you know it's good to hear a little bit of context. So thank you, Jan. Um, yeah. So with the the BF manageability goals, I think all these slides are actually the same as they were last time. So um, what I'm just going to do is just. In fact, this one is the only one that's new, um, which is just a summary. So 
um, there's not a huge amount in this table as you can see and then it, it go, we're going back into you know where do we want to put our focus and honestly I'm not um, sure what this slide is <laughs> so um, yeah so I somebody shout stop if you think there's something here that we need to discuss um, otherwise I'm going to just say uh, let's let's move on to the next thing where we have an update Um, so I don't know who is the best person to talk about the Active Directory DNS integration. Is there anyone on, on the call who uh, would like to? John. John Hickson. John here? Oh yeah, hi John. <laughs> I'm saying your name many times and there you are the whole time. I didn't see you. Audio uh, I, I just want to point out that in our environment, we, we do have AD and DNS integration inside of FreeBSD for an enterprise environment, as well as OpenLDAP and DNS integration in a FreeBSD, a complete FreeBSD uh, native environment, and we've been pretty happy with them. Uh, I guess there are some enterprise C problems that we're facing. Uh, you know, stuff that Windows people would call like uh, group policies and stuff like that. But there are some bypasses, and I think Chuck gave a very good talk about it in BSD CAN. They're not using AD, they were using uh, NES, which is, I think, is older than me. Uh, but they solved those problems, uh, I think, using Ansible, which might be also a good way to introduce to the community into having AD plus DNS plus Ansible as a complete enterprise solution but yeah overall we're happy and i think i wrote some of the documentation in the wiki um i'm pretty sure i wrote some of the documentation in the wiki <clears throat> okay let me just see what else we have here yeah so it's, it sounds like maybe there are a few things that we can add john are you having problems with your audio looks like yes yeah <laughs> so, say yes if you're having a problem with your audio <laughs> all right um did anyone else want to add anything about active directory dns or should we come back to john if he figures out what's or if we figure out what's happened okay um ai support i think so I don't know too much about the DP on free BSD. Is that um, something that anyone would like to comment on? Uh, so a, a lot of um, a lot of this is still fairly um, fairly early, and um, Greg and I have been talking to a few um, <coughs> excuse me a few different organizations who have been interested. In trying to collaborate um, on on aspects here, um, but there's not a lot uh, really to pass on. Okay, I'm just going to. I just had a quick question on that. <clears throat> is there work on uh, other than the Nvidia stuff, or is that the only DPU that we're looking at supporting? So I would say there's there's interest there's broad interest but um, but so far um, all of the the tangible investigation has been Nvidia. Um, if there is um, if there if there are specific um, specific other vendors of interest um, I'm very interested to, to hear what uh, what they are um, or if it's just kind of general um, we don't want to single source. Uh, it's it's the AMD stuff. Yeah. Yeah, so we we do have a um, the foundation does have a good relationship with um, with AMD, and so we can certainly pursue uh, pursue that. We're we're meeting with them actually uh, a little bit later today uh, for a monthly call. Yeah, because that's the that's the gear that we're looking at acquiring okay. through our okay. AMD connection. So that's why it's more interesting to us. Okay. <clears throat> Okay. 
Um, so there is another slide here, which is about CUDA, um, which is another thing that would potentially be worth looking so the, at. So the specific um, uh, specific state with or specific issue with CUDA is we have a few different um, uh, a few different folks who have uh, done more or less effort to get the Linux. Uh, uh, the entire Linux user land stack running on top of the Linux later on FreeBSD. Um, and I think there is value in trying to make that a sort of, I mean, whether you want to call it production quality or, or not, make it as sort of uh, repeatable and automatable as possible. Um, but uh, my goal with it anyway is to have a, a usable, um, reference implementation that uses the Linux uh, Linux stack to be able to try to eventually demonstrate the a broader community desire for it and hopefully push uh, NVIDIA in towards uh, producing FreeBSD native, uh, the FreeBSD native version of the stack. Yeah, our, our scientists currently, we couldn't get it to work on FreeBSD, so we're just doing a PCI pass-through. Uh, to Linux, but uh, having it natively would 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 make my life as an admin much much easier. Of course. Is there any work being done on the OpenML stuff for FreeBSD? Not um, not that I'm specifically aware of. And the related question is sort of related because it's related to the NVIDIA world is uh, a Vulkan support for FreeBSD. Yeah, um, I, I, I think the story is largely the same um, uh, there. Um, there's um, uh, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to remember what uh, I don't recall the specific details. I do, uh, I do remember some discussion of it uh, recently, but I don't don't remember what the current. Uh, um, I'm missing something, or uh, didn't Nvidia add a while ago uh, Vulkan support to their FreeBSD blob driver? I believe that's right. Uh, so because... all I can say is that trying to find it, I was looking for it, and I couldn't find. And they found lots of stuff from 2017 talking about it and uh, and related, but I haven't couldn't find anything recent, so I just may not have looked in the right place. But I didn't see it. So I see, found a driver update from 2021, which added support for Vulkan 1.2. So if they updated the Vulkan version and added extensions, uh, there must be support, I would say. But it may be that it doesn't work under the Linux later. No, our, our interest in it was for uh, native FreeBSD uh, for what we're doing. Oh, it's, it's all, we needed it as part of something for, um, for getting uh, Unreal running, um, and that was where again we find a really old version of Unreal that someone ported in the before times, and uh, current stuff doesn't seem to be uh, working or compilable. Um, let me just go to the next one. Yeah, so the only other thing to say about this, and I think it's really what Ed touched on, is just that there is um, likely to be a, a launch of a FreeBSD AI lab. Um, and so we'd be looking for any interested FreeBSD users to come and, and try that out and, and do things with the lab. Um, so that that's not really. I mean, Ed, you can probably say more more about this, but there's. It's. I don't believe it's ready yet, and it will just be for. I guess some proof of concepts and things like that. Is that right, Ed? Yeah. Um, 
Yeah, the intent is just to to centralize um, a variety of hardware and make it available for um, for people to, to have access, um, kind of on a as needed um, interim uh, or short short term basis. Um, and uh, our eventual goal is yeah to populate it with as many different types of um, uh, types of processors and. Uh, GPUs as uh, as there is interest uh, in the community for. Yeah, the same question comes up about AMD. They just did a big dog and pony show last week about uh, their OpenML uh, new neural engine hardware, and it it was very well received in the general public. So it's mm -hmm. again. Um, uh, yeah, there's a lot of focus on NVIDIA, but there's a lot of new work that the OpenML stuff is supporting and Apple supporting that as well. Okay. Well, look, I mean, it, as Ed said, um, I think it makes sense to try and get as much diversity as possible in terms of hardware in there. And I'm sure that that, as soon as we can, um, as soon as we can do some more work on that, we will do. Um, all right, let me just then move us on to open JDK if that's okay. Oh, I, actually, you know, before I go too much further, John, I can't remember what it was that we, we were going to get you to jump in on. Do you want me to scoot back in the gaps? John, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Oh, do you do you want me to um skip back to any any previous slides, sure. or do you want to speak to anything? I don't. I don't need the slides. I could just talk about um, okay. what what's being done. Um, so I, I I met up with you guys a couple weeks ago about uh, Samba and AD and DNS, and for the AD and DNS integration, um, we we. We basically came to the conclusion that all, all that really needs to be done is it needs, the entire process needs to be documented and documented well. We, we have all the tools in ports and in base to, to do to integrate into an active directory. So, so I, I volunteered to do that because um, I've done a lot of this, this before. And um, for the Samba stuff, what, what we'd like to do is we'd like to get better testing, better integration, and um, We'd like to upstream all the various patches we're carrying. So, and and I'm I'm in contact with the Sama team, and um, I, I'm just starting that process. So I I don't know where that's going to go, but they they're open to supporting FreeBSD better and getting the they're open to it. So I'm going to work with them on doing that, and that's that's a summary. That that's great, John. And do you do you have any asks while you're doing that? Is there any support you could help with? Uh, do with, I not, say. not at this time, no. Right. Yeah, well, that's fantastic. Thank you. Um, all right, well, let's. I think I've sort of already said what's going on with Open JDK, which is that we opened a contract position and uh, we haven't managed to get anyone over the line to actually take that contract. So um, I guess there's a there's an ask there is if you know anyone who would like to take on this kind of work, then please pass them our way or vice versa. Um, John, you've already talked about Samba a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. and then, yeah. Ed, do you want to talk about .NET or? Uh, I mean, I can... Um uh discuss it fairly briefly um uh there's um a couple of of people specifically uh Aerodiat, um who who in the community who have done a lot of work to get the the port um into good shape and so package install.net basic for dot net eight uh basically just uh basically just works um and the foundation is uh, working with Microsoft to get uh, a blog post out about it and try and get a little bit of visibility around it. 
um, the, pri the primary motivation and interest, um, in the, at least from my perspective, is uh, to be able to try to pursue Azure pipelines and GitHub Actions support for FreeBSD natively. Um, and so having uh, reasonably well supported .NET is, um, is important for that. Um, one, uh, one interesting change that Microsoft has made over time is that um, in the past, they considered official support to be uh, a, a, a .NET pack to, that, that for official support, they had to uh, be the ones to actually build the .NET uh, package that's installed on whatever um, whatever OS it is that's running in Azure um, or running um, uh, wh whichever OS is running for it to be officially supported. It was it had to be built by them. Um, that is no longer the case. So their you know their their suggested deployment um, on Ubuntu, for example is to install the Ubuntu built .NET packages. Um, and so that bodes very well for us in that um, suggesting that .NET get installed from the FreeBSD package collection is no longer uh, uh, outside of the scope of, of what they consider uh, for, uh, for considering supported. Uh, I see there's a hand raised. Yes. Uh, yes. Uh, yeah, uh, about the enterprise level of .NET support. Now that Windows comes with Dtrace built in, mm -hmm. uh, I guess I guess Linux is now the only one left out, unfortunately. Uh, can we also, as a next step, to bring Dtrace hooks inside .NET because that would make the process much easier? Because I could imagine where Windows developers could develop on Windows machines, much most of the time they do, and then we can deploy it on FreeBSD when we still have the same .NET hooks or, or probes in this case, uh, so we can debug on production more reliably. This has been a very common problem because using the PID provider is not that safe with .NET due to the way that the IL works. Uh, but in this case, it, it Microsoft might, might be even more interested to have better Dtrace support for, for .NET for, for, because if they do the work on Windows, it will definitely be uh, portable to, to FreeBSD. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I was hoping that there, I was hoping that the Microsoft's uh, Dtrace announcement um, might have meant that there was some um, Dtrace support <laughs> that would show up in .NET that we can just um, turn on. Um, it seems like it's a little bit more uh, aspirational than that, perhaps, but uh, but that is is absolutely something that um, uh, we'll, we will bring up with them in the in the next call that we have that. Um, there may be an opportunity for us to collaborate uh, on uh, on uh, on helping to test and, and work on the integration. Thank you. Okay, um, moving on then. So SMBFS two and three. I think I probably gave you the only update that we really have, which is. Um, that we're looking for a donation from someone who's already done it. Um, so we're working on that. <laughs> Kerberos. Uh, da, 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 da. Is anyone who has anything to comment about on this slide? Uh, I mean, the only thing uh, I'll pass on probably uh, anyone who's kind of been following along is, is aware of it but I mean Sai is uh, is making uh, uh, steady but slow progress uh, I will say um, he's got a uh, number of things in the non-computing world that are um, uh, not leaving him an awful lot of time to work on it but uh, I, at this point I don't really have any um, uh, I have no worry that uh, I, I'm confident that it uh, he'll be able to have it um, in time for her uh, to produce the event. Or I expect that he will. Oh, sorry, I've skipped ahead there. Um, and Charlie, did you mean to still have your hand up or was that just uh, from the last time? Oh, I, I guess that's from last time. Apologies. Just checking. <laughs> Don't want to overlook you. Um, all right. EBPF, it's seems like nobody's really working on it and nobody's really asking for it. I think it maybe just came up for sort of 
the sake of completeness and maybe on the wish list um any one have any suggestions that that's not an accurate read um i think once we have the oci runtime stuff in place it will reveal the next problem which is that alias jails are fast and don't require you to disable any offloadings but right now software bridging has hard performance ceilings which are not what you want um, because even 10 gigs will be a problem uh, on most hardware if you have to use the internal bridge driver uh, once you have to disable the LRO and TSO support and yeah, so at that point we need something better than what we have right now. And Linux is using, among others, eBPF for this. Yeah, yeah. We, so we have with IFLIP maybe a now that that's there and we have proper um, concurrency kit support in the kernel, maybe time to revisit the bridge driver and similar to what OpenBSD did, uh, start with a initially less feature complete bridge driver from scratch with a clean design which splits the layer two and the layer three uh, or ethernet and IP uh, correctly so that you are, the moment an interface is a member of the bridge, it's no longer an IP interface. It's only a member port on the bridge. And then, oh, and if you want the host to have a logical port on the switch, you have to create something like a VEther so that you split the bridge for, and its members and the host port on the bridge in such a way that they follow the structure and abstractions in the co code instead of the bridge driver being almost the <laughs> ultimate layer, uh, layering violation in the network yeah. stack. Yeah, um, I'm, I think you're explaining that in a way that even I can understand, but um, it might be something that we need to come back to outside of this call just because um, it seems like it, it might be a bit more detailed than we need right now. Um, okay, awesome. Well, look, I didn't know that, Jan, so that's really helpful. Thank you. Um, and maybe that will keep it on there just as something that we might need to come back to once we have that OCI support. Um, do you pronounce this this or CIS? Um, so this sounds like this is um, close to being done. Is, do, do you know much about this, Ed? Um, we are, I think, fairly close to the point at which, um, I can't remember the terminology they use, but um, uh, there's a two or three week period, uh, review period, um, where we opened up to people in the, the community for, for feedback and comments. Um, and I think we are, uh, I expect that will be sometime in the next several weeks. Um, and then so, and then after that, it will be published. Uh, uh, I think it's, yeah, it's, it's fairly close to being, um, being publicly reviewed. That's great. Thank you. Um, and I think that is actually the last slide. Um, so is there anything that wasn't on the agenda that folks would like to talk about today? Questions? Uh, yeah, I, I, I have one topic, which is, I guess, in could be one of the core parts of the uh, enterprise working group. I, I did email Greg about this, um, mm -hmm. which is basically on the project's website, we have a section where it mentions, uh, let's say, service providers for FreeBSD. Right now, the, the list is outdated. Uh, a lot of the companies either don't exist, some of them are not doing any more FreeBSD work. Some of them are actually doing FreeBSD work. They're just not advertising it like before. And also yeah. there are new companies. Uh, Clara comes to mind, for example, right? Um, so I guess, because uh, one of the most common questions that I get from enterprise customers is, who can we pay to solve our problems? 
right? Um, and it, it's usually divided into two parts. One of them, which uh, cloud providers provide FreeBSD support. Uh, in the in the website, it says which hardware vendors there are. <laughs> uh, most people uh, these days, they just buy commodity hardware anyway. Uh, so I guess we can add a section for cloud providers who either have first class FreeBSD support or a third party FreeBSD support. So like you can deploy it yourself. Um, that has been verified by the community or the project. And the other one is a list of, because I, I, I can think of at least four people in this call who are providing free BSD support as a company or as a freelancer. So that might be a, a good place for a lot of companies who want to use free BSD in an enterprise environment, but they don't know who to contact. And, you know, it depends on the region. A lot of EU people want to hire in the EU. Uh, a lot of U.S. people in the U.S. based on regulations. Some people look for "quote unquote" international companies, you know, sort of say. So it depends. Uh, but that might be a very low hanging fruit for a lot of enterprise because in the Linux world, it's like okay, we can go to IBM or Red Hat, right? We don't have the equivalent of it in FreeBSD. We have something much better, which is a lot of competition. <laughs> so um, it might be also a good place to. To, to advertise that on the website and, and update the company lists as well as the cloud vendors. Yeah, that's great feedback. I think that's that's something that, well, I would hope we could do that relatively easily or, or at least um, moderately easily. <laughs> so yeah, no, that's really good feedback. Thank you. Um, anyone else had something that they'd like to bring up? I'm thinking of asking Kami if he'd like to talk about the manageability layer that he, that he was talking about in another call. Yeah, I, I'm happy to. Um, so the issue that that I've been looking at is uh, we have lots of projects that either currently are FreeBSD based or <clears throat> Uh, previously were FreeBSD based, things like TrueNAS and um, and PFSense and stuff like that. And one of the things that would make uh, stuff much easier to deal with um, from a manageability standpoint would be ensuring that anything that you can do, any, any configuration that needs to be done, you can do with uh, an API. So right now there's lots of stuff that the only way I can make changes to it is edit a configuration file someplace. And um, that's a real problem for a billion reasons. Uh, but if we start looking at as a requirement for every new thing that we add and for everything we do that you have an API that, uh, that makes it possible. So if I want to adjust you know, the networking for FreeBSD for my my core host, I can do that with an API instead of needing to um, go, you know, edit programmatically the pfSense file, which is, I mean, the uh, uh, pfconf file, which is not really an easy task. And it's true for almost everything else in the same way. And if that became a standard, uh, it makes it much easier um, to, be able to put GUIs on top of stuff, and uh, and then you get you know more of the kinds of things. Because the biggest issue we have right now is, as an example, I can run TrueNAS or the older version of TrueNAS, right? Um, but uh, but it's running TrueNAS; it's not running FreeBSD. And if we could make stuff like that easy to do, then it means you can build an appliance that is uh, truly FreeBSD and has a management layer that does, you know, management, but it means that I can still do real FreeBSD stuff easily underneath. And that's sort of, uh, that's the, the general idea. To, to manage the most, um, re well, the most realistic uh, steps that have been undertaken in that regard, uh, the libxo from Juniper and uh, importing libucl and efforts to add libucl to more and more uh, base system uh, demons and commands. But 
those efforts have stalled out uh, because it's just a lot of tedious work. And both of these, even if uh, JSON is the universal format between the two, are still file-based, not API-based. Um, so you can, then you get into semantics about what is it if you treat the file as a key value store and it's programmatically writable without corrupting the files. So uh, basically think of it as an ultimate uh, sysrc-like command where you have your configuration store. Um, was, yes, would be nice, but if I understand you correctly, you're asking for is more, namely an API which you can programmatically target to similar to what, uh, say something like a micro decoder, so where you have an API, you write to it, you have a running configuration, you have a auto start configuration, modifying the running configuration does not change the stored configuration. You can commit your changes, so something almost like a salt stack minion to become part of the base system or what? Can you? Yeah, that would be. I mean, specify in, in, what in, you need. Yeah, in my in my ultimate world, um, uh, having in part of the base system anytime, any exactly as you described it, from the standpoint of I have an API, I can change the current running configuration. I want to uh, add a port. I can do that. Um, uh, and then I have the ability to, I mean, again, the ultimate world would be, I can save it as the, as the auto start, or I can save it as um, a, uh, a, a set configuration that I can use for other things. The, the, big, the big issue, of course, of all this stuff is if I can, uh, you know, you get, you get a system where you have a GUI that modifies the configuration file, and then someone goes in and modifies the configuration file by hand, and now you're in the worst situation, which is the GUI doesn't work and doesn't understand it, and the or or it makes a change and it messes everything up, or you just don't have anything. And so that's the the idea of having everything go through, um, go through an API. It's just sort of where we're headed with everything else in the world, uh, and it just makes it much easier. It also means that remote manageability becomes an easy thing because it's much easier to build a, uh, a server that you can run to handle that. If it's not editing files, if it's sort of, again, going through an API, it just makes everything uh, easier in the process. And I understand that it's, I, I get, and it's 100% clear that it's tedious work um, and such, but it's one of those things that would just make stuff so much better and make systems so much more manageable uh, across the board. And again, it doesn't have to be done instantaneously, right? Not everything has to happen in one shot, but as we, any new thing we add, any new bit of manageability, we should require, in my view, that there be an API, a first class API uh, approach to being able to to handle that management. Um, I have to disagree with that because we are so far removed from having this configuration management mechanism be stable and sure. Because right now, if you have an API to do something, what that really means is you have state which only exists at runtime. Unless you have a really robust way to store that state to disk and load it back up again. I know that it works both directions without losing any state. It's a very fragile all or nothing approach unless you do get it perfect. Um, and it, this kind of, it has to be perfect is the problem why you can't add it incrementally if you design it like that. It would have to be a flag day on which the personality of what it feels to use FreeBSD completely changes. Um, so, so, sorry. So that is totally unrealistic to achieve even if you wanted to, 
because you would fork it into something which feels completely different is maybe great to manage, but manages completely different. So you would have to design it if you want to be able to incrementally add it to the system, it has to be in such a way that it works in an open world where it is responsible for what it knows and it has to be extensible. It cannot be a closed world where it's in full control and only the API exists from day zero. Um, I'm just going to jump in for a second, just because we don't have a huge amount of time left. Um, it, so it sounds like this could be an interesting topic for further discussion. It sounds like possibly it, either it is not possible or we need to explore it a little bit more to see like what is possible and what the requirements would be. In terms of adding it to the enterprise working group list, I'm not sure how things were ruled in or out of the list in the first place. Is Does anyone have any sort of recollection of how that was working? Do we just keep adding more stuff? I'm guessing that's not the best idea. Um, or I can take this offline. And, and when, when we initially um, started the list, I think we um, uh, were fairly, um, uh, we, we, we did not, uh, edit the list uh, heavily as we were going. We basically just took all of the ideas that people raised, um, and then we had a few iterations of kind of prioritizing and understanding um, where things uh, where things came. But I think there's, um, I think the the hurdle to putting new, uh, the barrier to putting new ideas on the the list is is fairly. All right. Well, how about this then? If um, folks are interested in discuss discussing it further, I'm happy to put it onto the list or maybe um, facilitate like another opportunity to discuss it either inside this group or not. Um, and, and we we can come back to it next month and, and see see where we're at with it. Um, it sounds like maybe, Kami, if you're interested in setting up some requirements that, that are sort of agnostic to implementation, then that would be really helpful. Sure. Um, a user story type of thing, um, and then we can we can talk a little bit about what what the feasibility on that would be. Um, all right, so we we just have a few more minutes. I just wanted to uh, extend an invitation to all of you to keep me proactively updated on anything relating to the working group, um, and and if you want to know equally information about any of the other work streams that you're interested in, um, reach out to me and, and if I can help you, I will. If you want to have, if, if you want to set up further meetings or further discussions with other people, I can help with that. Um, so I'm just basically here to, to make this run a little bit smoother, um, to, to keep everybody in the picture a little bit more. Um, and I probably will reach out to you um, from time to time, depending on, on what you're working on, to, to ask you for information if you have any. So. Um, if I made this call like monthly on the, is this the second Wednesday of the month or the third? I'm not totally sure, but anyway, which one it is. If I, if I did that monthly, would that generally suit you all? Looking around to see yes. if folks look comfortable with that. I feel like monthly is probably fine for now, but if we are making great progress, maybe we'll then make it bi-weekly. It's not been an exciting day. All right. Cool. Um, anything that I haven't talked about, we haven't talked about, missed anything? Final thoughts? Jerry Springer in the room. All right. Perfect. Well, thanks, everybody. I'm really great to see you again. If I've seen you before, I'm really great to meet you if I haven't. Um, um, and I'll be in touch with the recording and um, anything else, like notes and stuff, that I can get transcripts out of this. Alice, just a quick thing. You reached out to yeah. me about some other stuff. If you want to uh, give me a call later, I can answer your questions. Thank and you. You sent me an email about stuff. I did. So. Yeah, I did send you an email. Yeah. All yeah. right. That's perfect. Is it the third? Thanks. Yeah, and I had I, I didn't have my calendar open. <laughs> All right. Thanks, everyone. Have a good one. Thank you. Bye bye. Thanks a lot. Bye. Thanks.